been adopted by the Whakarings, they call me Siefi. Siefi is Jeff in Samoa. When they realised that I was a queen, <laughs> they um, changed Siefi to Sefina. So Sefina became my, um, my girl name, drag name. Sefina Safuente Santiago's Sabato Sanfras Jr. actually, in, in all its entirety. When I was a kid, there were signs that I was a little bit different to everybody else. I knew what I liked, which was dressing up in my auntie's clothes and shoes and uh, running around the house, you know, with her dressing gown on and having my uncle say, oh, look, that boy's wearing a dress. And my auntie saying, he's all right, leave him alone. So I had a couple of angels in my childhood that were okay with play. It wasn't until I really lived in Sydney that I found self-acceptance as a, as a gay guy. I was walking home from a Sydney Mardi Gras and this little voice said, you know, it's okay to be gay. Go and, go and tell your mum and dad. So I did. Um, I told my mum and she, she laughed and she said, oh, thank goodness. We, <laughs> we always knew we were waiting for you to say something. I met this beautiful... Um, Fafafine called Anna, Tawa Anna. And I didn't know she was Fafafine when I met her, but I clicked with her. She introduced me to all her friends who were the Samoana Nepal team from Wellington. And when I met them, saw them, I could tell straight away. I was like, oh, wow, they're queenies, you know? Um, Fafafines. And that's when I realized, I thought, oh, I asked my friend Anna, I said, Anna, are you Fafafine? And she goes, she said, yeah. But she had had a sex change operation. And I was like, wow. And so they became like my family, I guess, because it was the first time that I found a group of people that I could relate to and explore and be myself a bit more and started dressing up. Some of them, um, my flatmates, were sex workers on, on Marion Street, Vivian Street. And so I explored a little bit of that side. They would work, work the streets and then I would just, you know, wait around for them and then when they've got heaps of money, we'd go to the nightclub and spend all their money. Then get a chicken on the way home and that was our night out. And that was fine with me until the, the night um, one of the guys stopped to pick me up. And then I realised, oh my gosh, you know, am I about to embark on being a sex worker? I wouldn't say I was a sex worker because <laughs> I wasn't very good at it. Um, that wasn't my buzz, I, I just felt uncomfortable. I didn't make much money, but I made a lot of friends. <laughs> the Mala language is a, is a little bit different because Samoans don't understand. They're speaking Samoan, but they're speaking, you know, Mala Samoan. I learned some of the little codes and the, and, and the tricks. Yeah, it was a real a time of freedom, I guess. I flew up from Wellington to Auckland for a weekend away in full drag, and that was a big, huge step for, you know, for me to go out in the day looking like that. It was 1992 and my friend uh, Noel, who um, was Cook Island, Akapaine as well, we decided to go to Amsterdam. That was the plan. On the way there, we'd stop in New York City. The week before going, I had just come home and that's when I came out to my mum and dad. And so, ironically enough, my dad says to me, you know, be safe. Just before leaving to go to New York City, I had my first ever HIV test and it came back negative. So I knew that I was HIV negative in New York City. A couple of weeks later, I'm in New York City. I met and fell in love with this beautiful Puerto Rican guy. And of course, you know, we don't have Puerto Ricans in New Zealand. So um, he was kind of exotic to me. We clicked. I fell in love. He didn't. <laughs> Cut a long story short, we had a, this whirlwind romance. During that time, we, you know, had sex a couple of times. You know, I said, you know, have you got a condom? And he goes, ah, oh, I'm all, you know, I'm good, I'm, I'm, I'm clean, I'm, I've been tested, I'm, I'm, I'm safe. And in those days, if you looked 
well, then you, you couldn't possibly have HIV. And in those days, there were a lot of sick looking people because people were dying all around us. And it was really, really sad. So he told me he was all right. And so we, did, we had um, unprotected sex and I felt really wrong about it. I, I stopped it, we ended it. I said, look, that was really sore and you know, I can't carry on. I had a shower and I was bleeding. And that's when I thought, oh, damn, what have I done? And then I got sick. I, I got the flu for probably three or four weeks. I had no inkling that it could have been what's called seroconversion, is when you come into contact with HIV and your body reacts. A bit like um, when you have a vaccine, it reacts to this new um, virus. In 1996, I got shingles in my arm. And shingles is a painful illness. It's, a, it's, it's part of the herpes virus family. And that's when I went to the doctors. So HIV is the virus that you get from passing it on to somebody else through unsafe sex, through sharing needles, through breastfeeding mothers to babies, um, through cuts, um, blood transmission. So HIV is the, the, the virus that causes AIDS or AIDS-related illness. No one actually has AIDS. They have an AIDS-related illness or, or AIDS-defining illness. The HIV virus, its sole job is to replicate. It attacks your immune system so much so that you can't fight off a common cold. Soon after that, it becomes pneumonia because you've got no defense, no, no, no immune system. And that's technically an, an AIDS-related illness. But I saw it all around. I saw it in Wellington. Um, I saw it in Sydney big time, like Sydney was really sad. Every week, you know, five, six, seven guys were in that passed away. Um, and the obituaries were in the local gay newspaper. So there was a bit of anger around. Did that fellow know? But, you know, I never saw him again anyway, so it didn't really matter. And I was the one that made the choice to have unsafe sex. He just suggested it. I was the one that said, yeah, okay, you're gorgeous, you can't have HIV, go for it, you know? So. I, I don't blame him, I, I just blame my moment of weakness, I guess, because had I, had I said, no, put a condom on, perhaps I wouldn't be here today talking about it. One thing I do remember clearly was when I left the doctor's clinic, I stepped outside and all of a sudden life um, took on a different meaning. I don't know, I was just more aware of my of being present and in the moment. And then I looked across the road and I must have been hallucinating because I saw this tree. It was iridescent, it was glowing and, and, and it was um, all this light was coming from it. It was my mum, my sisters and my brother I told. Just told them, look, got some news. Just found out I'm HIV positive. My sisters burst into tears and cried. They said, how long have you got? Uh, my mum, she just... She didn't cry, but she did say, um, it's all right, you know. Um, and she said, it will be okay, we'll get through this. So um, in those early days, if it wasn't for my family being cool with it, I could easily have walked a different path. I've been undetectable for more than 10 years. And when you're HIV and you start medications treatment, you become undetectable. What that means is you can't pass it on to somebody else. And that's huge for, for those of us that are freaking out about ever having sex again. Um, because many of us don't, because our biggest fear is that we're gonna pass HIV on to somebody else through a sexual activity. HIV is such a, a big part of my life. It's, it's one part of my life, it's not all of my life. Because of the nature of it, I think it's important to just to speak and support. We're setting up a new um, <clears throat> organization for Maori living with HIV called so our whole vision is providing support, advocacy, information, education to other Māori living with HIV. And once we, we get bigger, we include our Pacifica brothers and sisters. What I would say to my 12-year-old self, I would say, um, yep, you're going to have a lot of challenges in life. You're going to have some fabulous moments. You're going to meet some fabulous people. You're going to look fabulous even. Always know that your, your family have got your back, your mum and dad will always be there, uh, no matter what. And I'd also say to my 12 year old son, to look after your teeth, go to the dentist, suck it up and um, face your fear.